Hello. Welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest today is Scott Hazlett. Scott is a California attorney and CPA, and uh, he practices in the areas of taxation, real estate, estate planning, financial problem resolutions, and 1031 exchanges. He's a certified specialist in taxation law, California State Bar Board of Legal Specialization, and he's also a qualified intermediary for tax deferred exchanges. Scott previously worked with Price Waterhouse and was an investment executive with Merrill Lynch. He graduated from Taft University School of Law in 1996 and set up his own law firm. He is a past president of the East Bay chapter of the California Society of CPAs. And in a past life, Scott was a sports writer covering Major League Baseball, National Football League, and other sports. Scott, thanks a lot for joining me here yeah, today. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So I mentioned, folks, that uh, Scott is a qualified intermediary for tax-deferred exchanges. And uh, he also does a lot of teaching uh, for the CPA profession in particular, uh, helping us to uh, better understand and, and do a better job with exchanges for our clients. And so that is what we're going to be talking about today, is tax-deferred exchanges. So Scott, um, as we get started in this, I uh, want to let people know, uh, today is September 25th. We're in front of the November elections. You will probably be seeing this show, in fact I will say you will certainly be seeing this show after the elections are over. And even when you watch this, probably next year, we won't have a clue of what the tax law is. Right. Um, so, Scott, maybe you could uh, comment a little bit about these, this uncertainty, the situation, and maybe a little bit about how it relates to tax deferred exchanges. Yeah, so the, um, right now we have a certain law, and effective at the beginning of the year, we're going to have uh, significant changes in the law. There are certain things that are going to expire, uh, new things will take their place. Uh, it's often said to be the uh, pre-Bush uh, tax uh, scheme era will begin in 1-1-2013. Uh, uh, one, one, uh, uh, one of the most significant changes uh, that I see, of course, in this, as it relates to 1031, is the fact that capital gain rate will be rising uh, to 20 percent generally, and the, um, that makes tax deferred exchanges all the more valuable if you're considering a strategy in, uh, in doing real estate transactions. Right. So the, the, the thing about the 1031 is, is that it's been a long, uh, it's been around forever, it's been around since the early 20s, and the idea is that if you sell uh, investment property, notably real estate, although it can apply to certain other uh, business assets, uh, you generally you pay a tax. If you you bought it for 100 and you sell it for 300, you pay tax on the 200 gain. Um, in the case of an exchange, if you bought, in that example, if you bought another property for 300 or more, you avoid that tax, and it's said to be tax deferred because the taxes you avoided are sort of pushed forward into the new asset indefinitely. Mm -hmm. So we can see that the exchanges, because the rates are rising, exchanges will become a, an increasingly valuable tool uh, in the new year. And of course, it's anybody's guess mm -hmm. what a lame duck Congress might do or what uh, a new Congress might do, and depending on how many Republicans, Democrats, independents, and, and those types of things, right. what will happen. Yeah. So there are a lot of commentators that are saying that uh, Congress will likely extend maybe for another two years, uh, you know, the Bush tax cuts. Obama really wants to see increases happen, at least for the people, uh, married persons over uh, 250,000, uh, single persons income over 200,000. Um, and so we're going to see some fights and see whether, you know, uh, we can come to uh, an agreement. Uh, the other thing, though, that has already passed, and it's another significant piece of this, is this <laughs> Medicare tax. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, that is going to be a 3.8% tax. Uh, it's sort of more like an excise tax. It's really weird. It's not really an income tax. It's not sort of included in your income tax, but it's another tax that they've enacted to help to pay for some of the health care changes. 3.8% that applies for investment income uh, for uh, married persons that have the income over 250 and the uh, single persons over 200. So actually, Obama's already gotten some of his uh, right. 
right. this tax increase. Right. Uh, anyway, so again, we'll go from 15% to 23.8%. Right, right. That's a very significant increase. And um, so, yes, it will motivate people uh, much more to seek exchanges. And, you know, I mean, for the rest of the issue, it'd be too late by the time you see this. Uh, some people may want to think about whether they want to go ahead and pay some taxes. But most people aren't going to be anxious to do that. Right. All right. Well, uh, you're involved as an accommodator for these things. Are people doing tax deferred exchanges on real estate right now? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. It is picking up. For a while there, uh, the, the standing joke was there are no gains, so therefore there's no reason to exchange. Pro uh -huh. Properties had declined in value. In many cases, they had gone below their uh, acquisition price or their, or their so-called tax basis. Yes. But it, certainly it's picking up. Uh, what we see in our office is uh, actually the ordinary style exchange where you sell uh, one piece of real estate and buy another piece of real estate. But we're also seeing things like improvement exchanges or reverse exchanges where the, the order of the transaction is flipped. Uh, so it's been, it's been an interesting year uh, for, uh, for our exchange practice. Yeah, that's great. So, um, you know, there, there's still motivation. You know, people don't want to pay taxes. And we're in Silicon Valley area. Uh, San Francisco Bay Area, uh, real estate is a little stronger here than in other parts of the yes. country. And there are some people that have held property for an awful long time. Right. And so if you bought a property in 1975 or some people in 1958, uh, right. it's, you know, inflation is probably 30 times uh, of what, what people paid for things back then. And uh, so th there's still some economic benefits for it. So again, maybe you can explain a little bit just the basics of what a 1031 exchange is. Right. So I'll do that best by example. So um, somebody is uh, considering uh, selling a property and uh, hopefully, and I would say this whether you're considering an exchange or a candidate for anything, hopefully anytime you're doing a significant transaction, you would call your tax preparer or tax advisor get some input, even if you think you know the rules, even if you think you, the internet is totally truthful to you, <laughs> which, is, uh, which is a scary thought, Yes. Um, at least run this by your tax advisor if you have one. If you don't have one, find one, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. So the, the, the upshot of that typically would be that somebody says, well, I'm going to sell this, and, and uh, the, the tax advisor would say, well, if you sell this, there's going to be this tax. And the dollar magnitude is X, some, you know, pushing, uh, pushing numbers around and so forth. Oftentimes the reaction is, well, that, I don't want to pay that tax, or I've already uh, leveraged this out, or there's a variety of things. But mostly, nobody wants to pay taxes. I mean, that's the, the bottom line. No matter how patriotic they might be, they don't want to pay. So the next reaction is, well, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to sell this anyway. How do I avoid the taxes? Well, the, the primary way, or a very common way, is a so-called 1031 exchange. 1031 is the code section of the Internal Revenue Code where this uh, rule is found. Again, the general rule is if you sell the property, you'll pay a tax on the sale, whether it's a, uh, a note or even an exchange and so forth. Now, the, the main exception to that is, and there's a variety of exceptions, but the main exceptions is most common is this idea that if you buy another property of a like kind to replace what you sold and you pay as much in purchase price as you got in uh, the sale price of the old property, then you avoid the taxes. So if somebody comes to me today and they say, I'm going to close sale of uh, property next Monday. Um, I don't quite know what I'm doing yet, <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm thinking about buying another replacement property. They sell that property for a million bucks. Uh, so their, their goal is within the next 45 days after that to identify a replacement property for a million bucks. And then, in addition to that, they have to close escrow on that from uh, 180 days from, from Monday. And if they do that, in connection with the uh, qualified intermediary, which is what we do, then uh, tax will be avoided on the uh, transaction. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you mentioned this thing about like kind. You're getting property of a like kind. Right. For real estate, what's like kind? Li like kind is very broad and liberal. Uh, like kind can mean an unimproved lot for land and building. It can mean a residential property for a commercial property. It can mean uh, country property for city property. So it's, it's very broad. The, the, the general uh, rule is 
is there a business or investment aspect to it? Is that the principal motivation for holding a property? Mm -hmm. uh, and if that's the case, then those things will be like kind. Now, as I mentioned, you can also do 1031 exchanges with equipment, which is not real estate. Equipment is a different story. Equipment is very specific. Uh, so a computer and, a, and an automobile are, are both machines, but they're not considered like kind for 1031 exchanges. Whereas an apartment building would be uh, like kind to of an office building for okay. real estate. Right, okay. Can an exchange result in taxable income? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So what might happen there is you have what uh, is traditionally been viewed as an exchange of property for some for like kind and some for non like kind, which is typically money. So let's say, for example, I have a free and clear property for a million dollars. I sell the property. And what happens mechanically is uh, I close on Monday and at the end of the closing, the money goes into an account held by the intermediary, which would be me. It's a f sort of a frozen trust account. Mm -hmm. The only objective of that money is to use to buy qualifying, uh, duly identified replacement property. So let's say that the taxpayer says, I found this really great property for 900000 And that's really all I want to do, 900000 so of the million in the account, use the 900000 to buy that replacement property. And at the end of the, all of that, when the dust settles, so to speak, the extra 100000 also goes back to the taxpayer. And that's property, even though it's money. And that is not like kind, because money is not like kind of real estate. So it's an exchange, yes. But that's said to be boot or other property. And that's, uh, that's how that works. All right. Um. So, I, I don't know, I don't see a particular question about it here, but why don't we talk a little bit about liabilities associated with the property here, right. because that's another, that's the sneaky sort of boot oh, issue. Correct, and, correct. And uh, so maybe you could comment a little bit about that. Well, well let's go back to that example for a minute. Let's, let's say I had a property, I sold it for a million dollars, and uh, assuming no closing costs, and let's say I had a loan on it of 300000 So what would happen there is 700 would go into the account. Now, the uninformed person says, well, I'll take my 700 buy another property, and then there you go, and it's tax-free, and it's an exchange. I use all my money. Well, the problem is the tax code views the payoff of that 300000 debt on the first part of the transaction also as a receipt of money, even though you didn't get any money. It's, that's what you say. It's very tricky. Mm -hmm. So the rule is, there's two rules. It's called the napkin test. The napkin test says, if I sell for a million, I've got to buy for a million. If I receive 700 in cash, I have to use all that as a down payment for the replacement property. Now there's an algebra there. There's the loan plus the money equals the purchase price. So guess what? In order to make up the difference, you have to get a loan. So the new loan will offset the old loan. Or you can put in savings. Or you can do a combination of those things. But, th but that's how it really works. It's the price and the equity. Those are the two things you have to watch out for mathematically. Mm -hmm. Okay, but yeah, but you're sort of watching these liabilities. Usually, you want to have a, the liability or debt is going to be roughly the same or a little bit more on the replacement property. And I guess it has a little bit of what you're talking about because it, since you're putting in the same cash, and if the sales price is going to be the same right. as the purchase the, the, price, the, the, the then, then it's going to make it up. Yeah, yeah, the algebra suggests it's yeah, the same. It's going to be the same. All right. Um, well, what's a deferred exchange and what's a simultaneous exchange? Yeah, so in the good old days when exchanges were frankly not that popular, there was a, there was a common concept in, in, mostly in the agriculture industry where uh, farmers would trade cows or they would trade machinery or they would trade land. And, they, and so you have a piece of land and I have a piece of land and for whatever reason we're sort of neighbors and maybe your land has water on it and you don't need water and my land is, I don't know, it's, got, it's blacker than that. <laughs> so we, we decide that both parcels are of equal value and we don't really care whether it's a $5 thing or a million dollar thing, we just trade. Yeah. And so the, the initial tax code back in the, uh, before the 1920s said, well, if I gave up a property, there's a tax. And of course, farmers were a big lobby and they said, well, wait a minute, Number one, I don't have any money, because anybody knows a farmer, they never have money. <laughs> and, and number two, I'm not really giving up the property, I'm just sort of going into something else. Yeah. I'm, I'm going into his thing and he's going into my thing. 
So if we did this simultaneously, really there's no way to measure the gain and there's no money to pay the tax. So the Congress said, hey, simultaneous exchange like that, no tax, de deferred gain effectively. So then in, later, much later into the 70s and 80s, came this idea of the so-called Starker Exchange. That was the guy who did the, the one who won in the uh, big court case in, in the uh, California area in um, I think it was actually uh, Washington, wasn't it? Well, in, oh, in, in, oh, our, in, our, in the West Coast. Yeah. In, our, in our circuit, yeah, yeah. In, our, in the West Coast, the Ninth Circuit. So the idea there was that the taxpayer owned the property, gave the property to another uh, third party, so and Boise Cascade. They, well, it was it was uh, Crown Zellerbach. Oh, Crown Zellerbach. Excuse me. Yeah. So down. so Starker gave some property to Crown Zellerbach. Right. And Crown said, "We won't give you anything right now, but you pick out some apartment buildings that you want, and we'll buy them for you and give them to you." And so, today I give you something. Tomorrow you give me something back, and that was an exchange, not simultaneous, is is uh, non simultaneous. Of course, IRS complained. They said it wasn't an exchange. It was a transfer of money. And, you, and so ultimately, the court agreed that despite the delay, there was still a valid exchange within the meaning of the uh, tax code. So, so there was born this idea that you could sell today and then buy tomorrow, or at least within 180 days, as we have now in the code. Right. And what happened in that particular case was they were dragging this thing out for years. Yes. And so the IRS is saying, listen, administratively, this just isn't going to work because we have to have a statute of limitations that's going to work. Right. You know, if, if you close the statute, then, you know, we, we don't have yeah. a way to assess the tax. And so they said, let's just put a lid on this thing, no more than 180 days. Correct. And... Uh, yeah, so that was uh, added to the code in 1984. Right, right. Okay. Um, I guess we're going to just have to keep moving because you know time is going. Why don't you explain a little bit about a reverse exchange? This is kind of an exotic. Uh, yeah, it was interesting. It's it's been it's been around for a long time. There was a case in '81 called Biggs where it was sort of first approved, if you will. Um, but the IRS finally got on board in the year 2000 when they passed a rule uh, internally that that gave a a structure to reverse exchanges and what they call them in the in the IRS uh, literature is a parking arrangement. And the idea is, is that someone can today buy the replacement property and at a later time sell the relinquished property. So that's said to be a reverse exchange versus the, the ordinary way that we think about it is, I've got to sell my property first and then I'll buy something later. That was the, that was the starker format that, that has been around uh, for about 30 years. So the, simply the idea is, is that you can, I mean, the takeaway on this, forgetting all the minutia and the rules, the takeaway is you can buy replacement property and provided you sell the relinquished property within 180 days, then you'll have a valid exchange and you won't pay a tax if provided all the numbers work out. All right. So obviously the financing is a little more tricky and, and some of the details of this and so you really do need to be working with some people that know what the heck they're doing. Yeah, in fact, we, we just got a call today and, and they're a parking arrangement and it's going to be that kind of a thing. And there's actually going to be improvements added to the, to the yeah. replacement property. So that's another feature. Uh, I always say there's a right way and a wrong way to do these things. And uh, we've been through you know, dozens and dozens of these transactions over the years. We've been doing this for over 20 years. So, so there's always a way. There's always a trap. There's always a wrong way. <laughs> There's always a last minute guy, oh, you have time to do this, sure, you know, what, 24 hours, that kind of thing. So to try to try to plan ahead a little bit, you know. Yeah, so. <laughs> it helps. Yeah, because, well, I guess we're going to talk a little bit about it right now, then, uh, and, and then we can talk around the issues. So what are the requirements for identifying a replacement property? Right, so keep in mind, you've got, you close on Monday, uh, let's call it the 1st of October, just for the sake of discussion. So 45 days from the 1st of October is November 15th. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually November 16th because you don't count the, the day of. So on or before November 16th, in that example, you would have a written, it's a letter basically or a form that is signed by the taxpayer that specifies a specific uh, property and that letter is postmarked on or before that day and sent to typically the intermediary, although you could send it to the title company. But typically it's sent to the intermediary and it's held. Uh, if the IRS ever wants to double check to see that you did this, it's held for uh, audit evidence basically. Mm -hmm. 
Absent any kind of identification like that, then the exchange is blown because the code requires the taxpayer to identify something in writing within that 45-day time frame. So if you don't identify anything, that means there's no eligible property and then your exchange fails effective day 46 on that timeline. Right. And as I understand it, well, that's the first day. But anyway, uh, as I understand it, uh, you can also identify by something like a fax or... Oh, that's correct. Yeah. You so can, it you has can, to have a date stamp. Yeah, the it? regulations require uh, uh, some kind of a date stamping uh, technique. And, you know, in, in fairness, I, in the seminars, of course, you've heard all the war stories about how people play games with uh, postmarking and empty envelopes and fax machine uh, date manipulation. And, uh, you know, you, I could go on and on, and there's we don't have enough time. But, but th those things are all... Uh, completely illegal and and shouldn't even be considered. Yeah, yeah. So that's our first date uh, benchmark. What about the second one? So using that October first uh, as an illustration, and I can't do the math that fast because I'm old now. <laughs> I used to be able to do it. Okay. Um, you have 180 days to close, so that would be roughly uh, uh, March 27th, I think, plus or minus. It's 180 days. It's not six months. So if you close on October one, it's 180 mm -hmm. days from that date. So once you've identified the property then you have to close and you've got to close by that deadline and if you don't close then the exchange fails and it becomes a, a, a not an exchange but it's a taxable sale right and so and actually we've got two requirements so one is the 180 days the second is is that the the uh, transaction has to be closed before the tax return due date. Oh yes, that's a, that's a limiting factor. So 180 days on the outside. I, I always sort of skip over that because it's sort of a fail safe that you. Let, let's let's use a simple example. Let's say it's December 1st. Yes. April 15th deadline. Of course, that's less than 180 days. Now, if you file your return on time, you've just cut off your your yeah. exchange replacement period, but your accountant won't let you do that. Because, you better not. <laughs> well, well, because he'll say oh, you did an exchange, did you buy the replacement property? So the accountant will say, give me, the, give me the paperwork. And you say, well, I haven't done that yet. And the accountant says, we'll get an extension on yeah. your tax return, and therefore you'll get the full 180 days by, yeah. by virtue of that. Yeah. So, one, provided that you're using an accountant. Right, right. <laughs> right. Because some accommodators aren't really good about babysitting their cl clients right, on right, this sort of stuff. Right, right. And... Uh, so I think it's important for us to bring this up, uh, that it is a second requirement, but it's an easy one, like you said, to take care of. You just file an extension. Of course, it means that you need to pay 90% of the tax. Right, right. You have, have, to, a good you have to pay if, if money is yeah. due to get yeah. a valid extension. Okay, we have about five minutes left and lots of questions. Um, but why don't you talk for a few minutes about the role of the qualified intermediary? Yeah, so the, the qualified intermediary is carved out by, by regulation. Uh, and, and as I mentioned before, Crown Zellerbach was sort of the first uh, intermediary, if you will. But now it's all commercial driven. So as, a, as an intermediary, I'm basically a mercenary. And I'm a trustee that holds money is really what it amounts to. Uh -huh. The sale uh, yields a cash, cash proceeds. If the taxpayer controls that either actually or constructively, then there's no possibility of an exchange. It becomes a taxable event. So the regulations have said, if you hire this agent to hold the money, who's a qualified agent or a qualified intermediary, and you have the right exchange agreements and other documents in place, the holding of the money is beyond the taxpayer's control within the right realm, and it's not a taxable event, which then allows the intermediary to place the money as down payment for the replacement property as specified by the taxpayer. So that, that's really the role of the intermediary. Um, you know, I, I wear a lot of hats in this world. As you read, I've got sports writer. I've done all these things, you know. So, and uh, yes, I'm a tax lawyer and I'm a CPA and I, I, I do the intermediary work certainly, but everybody wants my opinion about what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I'm happy to give, that's part of the, that's part of the service. So, um, I always encourage people to talk to their own advisor if they're in some kind of a tricky or dubious situation or something that's uh, uh, not quite clear because that tax preparer is going to have to sign a return and uh, it's quite embarrassing if they get word late uh, expecting a certain outcome. Uh, so, so it's a team effort. It really is a team effort. Right. And 
one thing is that <clears throat> really the, as I understand it, the intermediary, intermediary is prohibited from having, uh, you know, let's just say the serious role. In other words, you can't be the real attorney right. for the transaction and be the intermediary. Right. And uh, anyway, but I've had to, a number of people that have come to me and they said, this is tax intermediary approved, this type of exchange. And I say, yeah, so. Yeah, it doesn't mean anything. And an intermediary's job is basically to hold the money. Correct, correct. <laughs> And yeah. not to be an advisor, but they do provide, you know, paperwork and other things. Well, and, and it'll give you general, I mean, certainly we know what doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. And believe me, if something, if there's some uh, problem, there's going to be some, uh, 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 some notice for that. Right. Okay. We only have a couple of minutes left. Um, can a vacation home or a residence be exchanged? Well, that's a great question. Uh, you know, 1031 requires that the properties involved, the replacement and relinquished properties, be investment or business properties. Uh, principal residence, of course, is personal use. That really doesn't qualify. But there's a special rule for that that we'll talk about later on a different program. For vacation homes, it's kind of a mixed uh, concept. T -t Typically, the right reason why you have a vacation home is because you're using it personally, and therefore it's not really going to be eligible. Mm -hmm. However, if, if you rent it out, it could be considered an investment property and therefore could be considered eligible. Now, there's a safe harbor that was adopted in 2008, mm -hmm. and we don't really have a lot of time to go into it, right. but it's possible. Let's just put it that way. It's possible. Okay. All right, folks. Well, we're really about out of time. We only have about a minute left here. Um, so mostly what I want to say, I think, at this point is, we haven't covered everything. Oh, right, right. This is a big area, and so, um, but hopefully we've given you some real basics to, uh, to bring to your tax advisor, and we want you to see a tax advisor. Yeah, yeah this is not a do-it-yourself deal. This is not a do-it-yourself deal. Um, anyway, Scott, I want to thank you so much for being my guest. And uh, folks, be careful out there. But uh, this is an important tax tool. It is widely used. I've done a number of exchanges over the years uh, with clients and uh, saved a lot of tax dollars for people that they can continue to invest in their property. We'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly.